I'm using the ANEO1S here at 20 watts for everything you see going forwards. I chose this because, well, with an AMOLED display with a modern mobile processor, man, I think that's pretty decent. If there's a 10% drop in performance versus the ROG Ally at 25 watts, I can live with that. Not least because the Ally has got a lot louder in recent firmware revisions at that wattage, presumably to address the much publicized overheating SD card issue. Uh, you're losing about 15% of performance against the 2S at 33 watts, but again, the price is worth paying because it's more efficient. And something else, the acoustics on the 1S at 20 watts are really actually very good. It's much quieter than the Steam Deck at 15. I'm reminded more of the ROG Ally here, certainly as it was when I first tested it. We'll be looking at some games running at or rather targeting 60 frames per second, but I'm mostly going to be at 30 FPS using frame rate limiters. And by taking a look at Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart, you can see why. I'm using Oliver's recommended settings here uh, from his Steam Deck video of the medium preset with high traffic density. 720p resolution, FSR2 performance mode. In certain scenes, performance can drop beneath 40 frames per second, but we're running the gamut here all the way up to 60. Now, on a standard 60 hertz screen without VRR, and when VSync off actually produces horizontal left-right tearing on these repurposed tablet and mobile phone displays, well, to be honest, I'd prefer VSync with a locked 30 FPS, or as close as we can get to it. And here in Ratchet, I can switch to dynamic resolution scaling to ensure that 30 FPS lock is as close as possible. Half rate VSync option also ensures consistent frame pacing. And here we go. What's pretty cool here is that signature elements of Ratchet all work really well. Even the hair rendering is very close to the PS5 presentation and performance is very, very consistent. General traversal in portals also works pretty well, I'd say. But this is a game with stress points, some expected, some, well, not expected. This wide shot of Ratchet descending into the main play area on the first stage, some drops there, but very fleeting. I guess at the other more extreme end, the classic multi-portal sequence at the end of the first level is likely to be just as bad as it's going to get as storage, CPU and GPU are all put through their paces. It's not exactly a highly playable segment, you're not really doing much here but you get some idea of the 1S reaching its limits with those performance drops. Even so, it looks pretty amazing overall as a handheld experience. Performance is consistent for the vast majority of play, and the OLED screen really is the icing on the cake. This really is good stuff. Here's The Last of Us Part 1 running at medium settings, 900p on FSR2 balanced resolution. We'll get to the choppy frame times in a moment, but this is an interesting example of choosing between higher resolutions and more aggressive upscaling versus a lower resolution but improved upscaling quality. Here I tried 1080p FSR2 performance versus 900p FSR2 balanced, and I generally preferred the 900p option there. And it pretty much plays everything at 30 FPS, but you can see the problem there, those inconsistent frame times with VSync active. This isn't like Ratchet where the half rate VSync option just works. I couldn't get AS Space's two frame rate limiting to work at all and was ready to write this one off. However, Chaldean's special K got things working rather well. It's a DLL you copy into the game directory and from there, you can use either a hard set half rate refresh, which has latency issues, or what Chaldean calls latent sync. This keeps vSync off for improved input lag, but flips the screen during blanking, so it looks like vSync on, but reacts more like vSync off. This should work on just about any game, and it makes an excellent, almost perfect 30 FPS experience in The Last of Us actually work. It looks and plays great. In terms of that balance between blur and upscaling artifacts with uh, 900p versus 1080p, in Marvel's Spider-Man Miles Morales, I actually settled on 1080p here with dynamic FSR2 using settings that have much in common with Alex's optimized settings on the PC version, which in turn are close to the performance RT mode on PlayStation 5. Of course, here I've turned off RT, which is perhaps a bit too much to ask for at this higher resolution. Game performance is mostly solid. You lose frames on camera cuts during cinematics, to be expected, not a big deal. 
and there can be some drops to performance in intense swinging sections where, yeah, perhaps we're asking too much for a mobile processor running at just 20 watts. So the thing is that the Air 1S only has a 5.5 inch screen and both 720p and 900p still look great. So maybe that would have been the route to go, but I was interested in trying to push the 7840U really hard here just to see how much I could get out of it. And of course, all of these handhelds have video outputs via USB-C, right? It's how I'm capturing these games to begin with. Point is, they're not just portable machines. And yeah, maybe you would like a 1080p experience. Bottom line though, I feel I got a really good Miles Morales gameplay experience here. 30 FPS with motion blur of this quality works, and there's a genuine feeling of a premium experience here, and a step beyond what Steam Deck offers. That's kind of what these handhelds are all about at the end of the day. So this balancing of output resolution and upscaling, it's interesting, right? Especially if we're talking quote unquote dot play. Here's another example to check out, a Plague Tale Requiem here running on the low preset, but tweaked so that all of the disabled features on the low preset, like contact shadows for example, are re-enabled. On the left, 900p with balanced upscaling, and on the right, 1080p in performance mode. This is using Asobo's own upscaling solution, by the way, which I assume they prefer over FSR2, hence its omission. Still, both visual options here do a pretty good job of hitting and sustaining 30 FPS, and there's not actually much difference between them when performance dips under the target. Yeah, cinematics are the main point of struggle here, I suspect, with depth of field. Uh, but gameplay runs really well, even in the classic rat deluge. Here in gameplay, 900p gives you just enough overheads to maintain 30 FPS, and that would be my preferred route forward. And again, in some scenarios, the blur from standard upscaling actually looks kind of better, I think, than more aggressive reconstruction artifacts to a higher resolution. So how about some 60 frames per second gaming action then? Uh, Forza Horizon 5 with 4 times MSAA at uh, 720p resolution compared on both medium and high settings. And at this point, you can see that in the stress test scenario provided by the benchmark, both have dips beneath 60 frames per second, but these are more egregious on the high setting. But really it depends on what the bottleneck is. I tried another benchmark sequence here tested on the Tullam Expedition, where the stormy conditions can likely cause complications due to constrained memory bandwidth. But in this scenario, it's mostly the cutscenes that are affected. Of course, for dot play, maybe you favor resolution. I achieved the same trick on the 6800U based handhelds, but Forza Horizon 5 plays out locked beautifully to 1080p 30, with the game's inbuilt frame rate limiter delivering perfect frame pacing. And yeah, with that motion blur, that looks awesome. There's actually quite a lot of overhead in there, to be honest, so you could either raise settings still further or chance your arm with an unlocked frame rate and perhaps tweak lower settings. Forza Horizon 5 has always played well on handheld hardware, and with the 7840U towards the higher end of its power envelope, you do get some excellent results. And you can take this game in many different directions depending on what you want from it. And believe it or not, I was also rather taken with my experiences in Cyberpunk 2077. Here are the settings I've chosen, which is 1080p with FSR2 quality mode, using a mixture of high and medium settings with a 30fps cap. So, in this scenario, using the game's inbuilt 30fps cap, the input lag is pretty lousy, but there are better results available, and I've already showed you the special K option I used in T-Loop 1. Failing that, weirdly using Tuner's 30fps cap in conjunction with the game's 30fps limit also drastically improves latency for some reason. Even so, using this medium slash high hybrid, I feel I've captured a great mobile experience to the point where I can even leave the high population density setting active, which I think is pretty fundamental to the experience. I had some dips to performance, leaving V's apartment block, but the usual crunch points, specifically traversing the Cherry Blossom marketplace, and even kicking off a massive gunfight, well, they all seem to work just fine with no performance problems at all, and that goes for in-city traversal as well. That pinch point around Tom's Diner, no problems at all. 
There have been quite a few impressive feats delivered with a 7840U, but weirdly I think this is the one I was most taken with. Seeing this experience play out on a handheld or even on a 1080p screen is something else. It just looks and plays really good. I've got a few more game tests to cram in. Two successes, one inevitable failure. So let's crack on. Metro Exodus Enhanced Edition, a game which I keep reminding people, requires support for hardware accelerated ray tracing. Features really impressive RT global illumination, but this game is built to scale and it works well even on a handheld. By choosing the high global preset, the normal RT setting and 4x VRS, I've got settings that are broadly comparable to the console versions. There are differences in terms of draw distances on objects. Consoles are denser close up than PCs high, but far more sparse in the distance. High is kind of like the closest overall match we'd get on PC. Half rate V-Sync in effect here takes us to 30 frames per second and we're using 720p resolution with a 0.8 scale, with temporal reconstruction making up the difference. I've often talked in the past about how dynamic resolution as seen on the consoles would truly benefit PC, especially handhelds, but the point is that the 20 w 7840U on an OLED handheld is effectively locking to 30 frames per second here, even in the most dense scenes in the game. Very few performance drops. And again, really remarkable to see this play out in your hands. I also wanted to talk about Remnant 2, which made a market launch for what was a very GPU heavy game, which effectively made this Steam Deck verified game far from a great experience. A patch followed with performance enhancements, but here, with the 7840U at 20 watts, I can run at medium slash high settings at 900p with XESS balanced upscaling mode for what is a pretty consistent 30fps experience during gameplay. Okay, so I know FSR2 is the go-to upscaler for these handhelds, but XESS's DP4A path is getting better, produces higher quality results than FSR2, and in some cases, the additional frame rate hit is worth it, particularly in Remnant 2, which is using Unreal Engine 5's Nanite microgeometry system for really high detail levels. I wanted to spend that extra GPU resource on the upscaling, maintaining that quality, and I think it pays off. I didn't play this one for long and I did note some performance drops during cinematics, but you know, definitely some impressive results early on in this one. I've got to end with a failure point though, because the PC port of Returnal continues to be the game that absolutely does not want to perform to any kind of acceptable level on any handheld I've tested. The stutter and the onerous CPU requirement on this one conspire to produce a massively variable, highly unsatisfactory experience no matter how much I lower the resolution and or increase upscaling factors. 30fps cap might help matters on this one, and I was playing this one before the Special K revelation that improved The Last of Us Part 1 so much, but ultimately, yeah, even if you could get it working, the visuals are still highly compromised with that combination of low settings and aggressive upscaling. Sometimes you've just got to concede defeat.